morning. We have come and gathered together one by one or two by two or household by household. We have come together to worship. And God has not been here waiting for us. God has been with us wherever we have come from this morning. God has come to this place of worship to share with us presence and love and guidance. And when we leave this place, God will go with us because he is the God of our every day and our every action in our every place. So let us give thanks for the opportunity to worship freely. Let us give gratitude for the presence of God and the presence of one another. Now we will sing a delightful hymn, Come in and sit down. You are part of the family, whether this is your first time here or you've been here forever. Uh, you'll note and take, take a watch on the uh, screen that the uh, refrains will not be sung after each verse, but it's indicated accordingly. And even now, as we're gathered together, there's still some people who 
don't feel comfortable by coming out into big gatherings, so they're still enjoying the online ministry. But the online ministry uh, should hopefully be more than just uh, one person. We really appreciate the hours and the gifts that uh, Ian McDonald brings to this ministry. Uh, we're really hoping that uh, some people would be interested in helping out. But ideally, if we can get another three or four people at least to uh, step forward and agree, uh, Ian will give everyone the tutor, a tutorial on how to do it, um, and, and then we'll be all set, and then it would be great to, to share that ministry among others. Uh, it really is valuable. I think that it's going to be something that we're going to be doing for a while. So other things are the 2022 calendars are here. So we have a limited supply of the United Church and calendars. Um, the cost is twelve dollars. So I'll ask you to please see Mary Carmichael if you would like to purchase one. The other um, another announcement is your November statements are in the Tobin Street lobby. Queen Street lobby. Queen Street lobby. Sorry. So please uh, feel free to pick those up as you as you leave, and um, that would be great. Um, and if you know someone who's not here and would like to take that to them, that would be greatly appreciated. And we're really moving into fall and the time is going by, so we must remember that next Sunday the clocks go back. So we'll be turning the clocks back, and then <clears throat> next Sunday is our Remembrance Day Sunday, which is being organized and led by David Griffith. And some other people are participating, so that will be a, an excellent service. Um, once again, we're going to be collecting shoe boxes for mission to seafarers to take down to the mission sometime after December 6th. You can see the information there. We've chosen our Monday night for the Dalhousie Supper, which uh, we all heard about in the October 3rd communion service. So it's Monday, November 22nd. So. Um, anyone who would like to help with this ministry can put the contribution at home and bring it to the church where it will be heated and then volunteers will deliver it to Dalhousie University. And this is really appreciated by the students because uh, there is a lot of food insecurity with students um, in the universities. Uh, Phoenix House Snack Program is back. It's been a tradition at Fort Massey that we collect money and other items for Phoenix. Um, in lieu of connected snack foods during November, we're asking people to send a financial donation directly to the Phoenix Youth Program. Um, there's a website there if you'd like to send any other um, toilet users, anything else that uh, they may need. And then uh, Fort Mass is about to uh, be 150 years old. Um, and so we're having uh, our anniversary Sunday in and so big birthday this is, so um, we're just hoping that uh, Fort Mass is a very generous congregation and we just hope that uh, they'll find some way to mark this. Uh, it'll be an exciting service and that's all I'm going to say. Let your appetites for that. Okay, so I'm going to ask Nancy Riggs to come forward for the minute of permission. Today's minute for mission is titled, Your Generosity Matters. We don't always know the extent of the good we do, even when we are giving generously. When we make a gift, we hope to have an impact, but often can't foresee how many lives we touch or how far our care extends. Mam Blood's story 
is a tangible example of how your gifts through mission and service send ripples of compassion across continents. Mapoot, the pastor, pastor, lives in Sierra Leone, where an estimated 27,000 citizens became amputees during the civil war that raged between 1991 and 2002. To support amputees, he visited in rehabilitation camps after the war. He turned to soccer, his country's favorite sport. He founded a soccer league for amputees called the Single A Amputee Sports Club of Sierra Leone to help restore hope. Now 350 members strong, the league isn't just about helping amputees overcome discrimination, restoring their pride, and providing their therapeutic support, as if these alone are amazing. Two years ago, Manhood decided he wanted to make an even bigger difference. So he flew all the way to the Asian Rural Institute, ARI for short, a unique school in Japan that your mission and service funds support. Thanks to generous supporters like you, ARI trains thousands of leaders like Manhood from all over the world to grow food, tend livestock, and be effective change agents in their community. After graduating from the nine-month program at ARI, Mambo returned to the soccer fields of Sierra Leone with a new goal to develop teaching farms where people can learn to grow food sustainably and support themselves financially by selling that food at market. Mambo and members of the Single League Amputee Sports League of Sierra Leone now run an educational farm and there are plans to convert more of Sierra Leone's fertile land into gardens and teaching centers. In a country where the average person lives just 43 years, Mambo's extraordinary leadership and the skills he learned in Japan saves lives. From Canada to Japan to Sierra Leone, Mambo's story is just one episode of how your gifts do a world of good. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. By supporting leaders that have with education and training, your generosity helps change lives around the world. Thank you. During this difficult and unusual time, the faithful people of God have continued their faithful giving through the church, to the community, to the wider work of God's people throughout the world. We give through envelope, through check, through par, through e-transfer. And in a great variety of ways, all those gifts end up literally and figuratively in the offering plate but in the offering arms extended from the world. Your, your congregation and recipients of our gifts appreciate the faithful and loving care that is behind such faithfulness. Let us present our offering and then share in the unison prayer at the conclusion.
Let us join together. We cannot feel their pain or know their struggles, but we give with generous hearts and we give with faith. For we know that we, loving God, will bless the compassion, the freedom, and the community that these gifts make possible. This week, again, I'm going to share from a book. I'm delighted to see that we have some youngsters as well as young partners <laughs> present. And uh, sometimes books can just gather things together and say them in the way we would like to say them ourselves. You may be familiar at least with the words of this because the book is by Dave Gunning and based on the song, These Hands a song which was co-written by Dave Gunning and George Cannon. Pictures are wonderful, and I'm sorry that distance prevents you getting the, the benefit without the erratic back and forth. Picture in your mind. Some hands have held the world together. Some hands have fought in wars forever. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands of mine? And you may want throughout the reading to look occasionally at your own hands and look at them for their size and their strength and what you do and what you might like to do with them. Some hands have blessed a million people. Some hands helped free the world from evil. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands of mine. What shall I do with these hands of mine? What shall I do with these hands of mine? The world could use a hero of the human kind. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands of mine? Some hands can stop a life from dying. Some hands Comfort a baby crying. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands of mine? I want to sing it from my heart. I want to hear it in the wind till it blows around the world and comes back again. All that we can ask is for ours to be free, to use them when we want for whatever we need. Some hands give voice to a nation. Some hands wrote the times they are changing. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands of mine? What shall I do with these hands of mine? What shall I do with these hands of mine? The world could use a hero of the human kind. So tell me, what shall I do with these hands of mine? We are all potential heroes of the human kind. We all have hands. And now we'll sing together.
this morning. Scripture readings come from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 to 24, and then Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. Then he said, There was once a man who had two sons. The younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what is coming to me. It wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. After he'd gone through all his money, there was a bad famine and all through that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to slop the pigs. He was so hungry, he would have have eaten the corn pots in the pig slop, but no one would give him any. That brought him to his senses, he said. All those farm hands working for my father sit down to three meals a day, and here I am, starving to death. I'm going back to my father. I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. He got right up and went home to his father. When he was still a long way off, his father saw him. His heart pounding, he ran out, embraced him, and kissed him. The son started his speech. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned before you. I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He was calling to the servants. Quick! Bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. Put the family ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then get a grain-fed heifer and roast it. We're going to feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead, and now alive. Given up for lost, and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. And from the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus arrived in the villages of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, What are people saying about who the Son of Man is? They replied, Some think he is John the Baptizer. Some say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah or another one of the prophets. He pressed them, And how about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter said, You're the Christ, the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus came back. God bless you, Simon, son of Jonah. You didn't get that answer out of books or from teachers. My Father in heaven, God himself, let you in on the secret of who I really am. And now I'm going to tell you who you are, really are. You are Peter, a rock. This is the rock on which I will put together my church. A church so expansive of energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. And that's not all. You will have complete and free access to God's kingdom, keys to open any and every door, no more, no more barriers between heaven and earth, earth and heaven. A yes on earth is a yes in heaven. A no on earth is a no in heaven. He swore the disciples to secrecy. He made them promise they would tell no one that he was the Messiah. Offered as wisdom for the journey. Amen. A generation or two ago, Occasionally, there was a warning given, an alert sounded. The repo man is coming, an alert which could result in individuals running away in fear and despair. We rarely hear the term today. Some know its origin, and to others it's totally unfamiliar. And the term doesn't get much press in an information search. I went doing a little looking just to see if I could hone the description of the term, but it wasn't much help. 
Google refers to it as informal, and this by stating, a man whose job it is to take things, repossess them from people who are not paying for them. The classic Oxford Dictionary dis dismisses the term as being North American and doesn't take it any farther than that. And the Canadian Oxford Dictionary states an issue of repossession of something that originally belonged to the repossessor or the individual or company he represents. Today, the job description and the employees to fulfill it still exist, but the title has been basically abandoned. I'm hoping to share an attitude adjustment with you this morning, one that may put a smile on your face and hope in your heart. I want you to turn your minds back, way back, back before the world began, back before the origin of creation, back before the existence of human life, before the structure and purpose of the world and life. Let's go back that far. And let's take a quick journey from then to now. Then there existed only the Creator, the Creator whom we call God. Gradually and with design and purpose, creation unfolded. With every new design and every feature of creation, God paused and considered the results of his work. And after each new act of creation, God was pleased with the results. According to the understanding and revelation of the biblical writers, there came a point in time when God said, and now we will make human beings. They will be like us and resemble us. So God created human beings, making them to resemble the divine. Created human beings, making them to resemble the divine. God created male and female. God looked at everything created and was very pleased. But from early beginnings, human willfulness and disobedience escalated over the centuries. The time came when God called and designated his servant Moses to lead the children of Israel, and God entrusted Moses with commandments on which the lives of God's people were to be grounded. The foundational rule was, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods. You shall worship no other gods before me. Over the eons, time after time, the people of God wandered away from God, became willful, careless, disobedient, a majority of them forgot who they were, forgot who they were created to be, forgot, it, forgot to whom they belonged. Some of the people, discouraged and fearful and hopeful, began to believe that somehow, somewhere, sometime, God would intervene and come in a new, fan, in a new manifestation. The introduction to John's Gospel sets forth the nature, the identity, and the purpose of Jesus. And John referred to those who yielded their allegiance to God through Jesus were children of God offspring of God. Their existence had nothing to do with human action or human design. They were the offspring, the children of God. And what a tempestuous relationship it has been since the beginning of time. And the only unchanging reality that enables us to continue it all 
is that we are children of a repo God. We are children of a repo God. <clears throat> Repossession deals with something that originally belonged to someone else. And we originally belonged to God. And humanity stretched that relationship to the breaking point time after time after time and still today. But the Creator God refuses to let us go or to abandon us because we belong to God. We are God's children. And whoever or whatever snatches away, snatches us away from the eyes or the activity or the heart of God for whatever length of time, God says, no way. They are mine. I want them back. I will have them back. I claim them. I set before you the reality that God is the most consistent repo reality in our lives. Jesus entered the world to share our humanity while at the same time giving us a tangible image of God. The reality of God's repo nature is given tangible example time and time again through the words and the actions of Jesus. Jesus came to make the reality clear that God, the creator, the maker of each and all, the divine parent of each and all, God wants to reclaim us. He made us. We belong to him. He wants to reclaim us. The people who had been created by God, like God, for God, had wandered intentionally and unintentionally so far away from God that they were no longer sure to whom they belonged and what was expected of them. Jesus came to reclaim those who originally belonged to God. In the process of being reclaimed, repossessed, humanity and individuals have sought to repent. When I was a child, <clears throat> eons ago, there were many, many times when I had become convinced that the magic words of my existence were, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, after mischief, or sauciness, or disobedience, I would proclaim, I'm sorry, mommy. And eventually, that wore quite thin with my mother, and one day she responded sternly, you're not sorry, or else you wouldn't keep doing it. I was shattered. It put some responsibility back on me. Now what do I do with that? Another response was seen in a seasoned military man who was experienced as rough and gruff. He led a questionable lifestyle and he was insensitive and unforgiving with his comrades. They began to experience a noticeable change in his behavior and his attitude. And gradually they worked up the courage to question him about the change. And he responded, I had an encounter with my Savior, and he commanded me about face. Military language that he well understood what it meant and what he must do. Repentance is not prim primarily about words, but about actions. Apologies and resolutions are weak and spineless and ineffective if change in behavior is not evident, whether we're talking about an individual or a leader or a country. If we do not make sincere and honest efforts to turn our lives around, our apologies, our repentance is useless. <clears throat> With genuine repentance comes redemption. 
and I, I hope you'll notice all the re's that introduce, that introduce each particular section of, of my reflections. They don't all necessarily <coughs> dovetail as neatly into the concept of repossession, but there's that, that sense of againness or another time or whatever in them all. And with genuine repentance comes redemption. To redeem or reclaim something, an exchange has to be made. Our relationship with God is not only about what God does, but about what we do in response. And with redemption comes reconciliation. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The Greek word translated reconciliation or reconcile referred to something that had been broken, fractured. And reconciliation referred to the healing that had taken place following that and the wholeness that had been restored. <clears throat> True reconciliation picks up the broken pieces of the truth or of a relationship or of a commitment and lets loose the healing freshness and power and renewal of God. Our God is a repo God, taking the first steps towards reclaiming what belongs to God. Like the grieving, anxious, watching Father, catching the first glimpse of his returning wayward son, the Father had been standing there for years watching, looking, waiting, hoping, praying, and one day there comes his wayward son trudging down the path to home with his head hung down in shame and regret. The father took the running steps towards that wayward son and immediately restored the relationship of sonship. He didn't take the time on apologies. He didn't take the time to hear the, the remorse or the repentance. He said, my son was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and now he's back home. Let's feast, let's party. This is our family. That's part of what it means for God to be a repo God. He doesn't say, stand in that corner of the universe while I lecture you, and then I'll consider where you are in my life. No, he comes running, running, and embraces us after all our falls and failures, failures and the relationship of parent and child and family is restored. Some years ago, I attended an event with the opportunity to explore a discussion group of one's choice. And I joined the group that was under the leadership of Reverend Stan McKay, one of our former moderators. And in that group, he reminded us that we are a remarkable people. Now, people say that in a variety of ways, and it's usually a compliment, but he used it differently. He reminded us that we are a remarkable people. Our birthmark is that we have been marked as one of God's people. We belong to God. And often the birthmark fades with the actions or the lack of care of our lives. But we are a remarkable people, and our repo God continues to reclaim us and remark us as his own. There are times when people take some of their treasured possessions to a pawn shop, believing that they need something other and more than what has been treasured and valued up to this point. They leave their treasure there in the pawn shop, receiving nowhere near its value, with the faint hope that it might be reclaimed at a later date. There are times when our circumstances in life may have driven us figuratively to life's pawn shop, where no one knows the true worth of our fragile and vulnerable lives. 
but one enters the pawn shop of life and with an authority that only he possesses, Jesus declares, I will redeem that life. Give it back to me. It is invaluable and it is mine. I will pay whatever the cost, even if it costs my life. Thank God, thank God that we are children of a repo God. Amen. As we come before God in prayer, we will begin with the singing of Lord, listen to your children praying. November the 1st is noted in the Christian Church as All Saints Day, but not all parts of the Church celebrate it equally with the same emphasis and significance. But it is good for us to pause from time to time to consider and to elevate people who come under the category of saints. There are two the definitions of uh, saints that I've heard over the, over the years that sort of catch my fancy and probably capture the majority of people's opinions. Some people that saints refer to people who are good and dead. But then there was a child in a Sunday school class and the teacher was 
asking them large questions, and one of the questions was, uh, what, what is a saint? Who do you think is a saint? And one little fellow was looking around the church, beautiful church like this one, with all kinds of stained glass windows, and some of them dealing with historic, significant disciples within the life of the church. And this little guy said, a saint is a person who lets the light shine through. So in All Saints Day, particularly because the reality of sainthood incorporates people who let the light shine through. People like you, people like us. Maybe not all the time, maybe not every day, we have our, we have our slips, but we are called, called to be God's dedicated people, called to be faithful witnesses. And so we think uh, on this day, tomorrow, this, this weekend, of, of the saints of God, past and present. Paul, writing to the Christian congregations in the early church, so many times he used that in his form of address to them, writing to all those in the church in Corinth called to be saints, greeting you in, in Ephesus and in Philippi, those of you called to be God's saints and other, other places he used the extension of that, God's dedicated people. And he was writing, he was writing to those who were alive and well and serving God's saints. You and I are called as well to be God's dedicated people. Paul, if he were here today, I would greet you, members of Fort Mass United Church, Call to be saints, you who are God's dedicated people. We join the long parade of God's saints. We didn't come first, we won't be the last, but we're in the parade because that's the parade that God has called us to and that is the, the uh, job description that we have been given. So today, tomorrow, next day, we give thanks for the past and all those who were faithful to God. And we ask for strength and guidance for the future and the present, which we are entrusted to care for. Let us share in the hymn, Give Thanks for Life, and it will be followed by the printed prayer.
join together as we do the unison prayer. God of the ages, we praise you for all your servants who have done justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with their God. We praise you for all the souls of the human creation and who, by their steadfast faith, have shown their discipleship in Christ Jesus. We praise you for those we have known and loved.
the blessing of God who gifted you with life, the blessing of God who redeemed your life, the blessing of God who empowers and accompanies all your living, be with you and stay with you forever. Amen.